we can see the lightning coming across and we're like, we're going to die. So there's just something about watching a species in its, in its natural habitat. And so we hear this noise, like this, like breaking of branches. And I'm like, did you hear that? And he's like, yeah. Just off in the woods. Didn't even think about it. I could have been eaten up by a bear. Welcome to Wildlife Outdoors with your host, Russell and Jose. If you have a passion for conservation of the outdoors, or you're enjoying a calming hike in the mountains, an exhilarating kayak trip on the river, feeling a fish on the end of your line, cooking on an open flame in a primitive campsite, or stalking big game, just waiting for the perfect shot, you're in the right place. So put on your boots and polarized sunglasses and come along for the ride. Welcome back to another episode of Wildlife Outdoors. This is Russell, and with us we have Jose and another guest that we are excited to have on. She is a small business owner, an outdoors woman, and a hunter. Welcome, Michaela. How are you doing today, Michaela? Good. How are you guys? Doing great. Doing good. I'm excited. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. So you are the second guest that we've had from the state of New York. So uh, oh. I, we don't have too many people from, you know, up in that region that we talk to. So I'm excited about this to, you know, hear the differences of, of just the animals and the outdoors and everything in general. So um, did you grow up in New York? Yep. So uh, I grew up in Western New York in like Holland area or right outside of Buffalo. So I grew up here. I was born and raised and this is still where I live. So, you know, eventually hoping to move out West, but right now I've, you know, grown up and lived in the same area my whole life. What makes you want to go out West? You know, part of it is hunting. You know, there's a lot better hunting, a lot of better options for game, you know, like in New York, you're kind of limited to what you can hunt, but also to just like the scenery, the mountains, like me, myself, I love to hike. So like for mm -hmm. me, the mountains, it's like, you know, just a whole nother adventure, you know, for here, it's like, it's kind of flatter. So it's like anything that you can hike, like I've already hiked it all. So it's like, I see. you know, you have to travel to the Adirondacks to be able to hike where it's out there. It's like you have more options to be able to just like go in your backyard and hike and there's more shed hunting opportunities and things like that too. Right. So <clears throat> being on the East coast, having grown up there, having lived there and then wanting to eventually go out West, is that just kind of a natural progression? I guess like more of a curious thing out of, you know, because you, you, it's, so different than the East Coast, I imagine. Or is there like a like a trip that you've gone on that kind of like just made you fall in love with the scenery and 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 what it has to offer? That's kind of feel like you like you're being drawn towards that. Yeah. So I've always just kind of liked like I've always had like more of a sense of adventure, and I've like you know New York's always been home, and I love all the seasons and everything like that. But I've always been more of like you know mountains hills kind of more into that kind of stuff and like so whenever I go to the Adirondacks I would just kind of feel more like at home and that's really what I love so the first year me and my boyfriend we went out to Colorado I was just like it's amazing out here you know I just like I loved it so much I was like I was like New York sucks like I don't want to live there you know so we went there we've been to Montana and Wyoming and it's like all those states you know it's like everything out there it's just so beautiful and it's like I go out there and I just feel so much happier. And it's like, not like I'm not happy. You know, I have a lot of family here and I love being around family too, but it's like out there, it's just, you know, a whole different kind of feeling, you know, it's like, you just feel at peace almost. Yeah, I definitely feel that every time I'm up in the mountains, whether it be, you know, I went to Breckenridge with my daughters a couple of years ago, or I'll go up to the Ozarks here in Arkansas. And uh, it's just, uh, you you explained it. It just feels like home. Like yeah. I don't know what it is about the mountains. It's just so homey to me. And um, I've never been out west, but I want. I mean, I've been to like Washington, Oregon, and, and Northern California. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I've never been to like Montana, Wyoming, or Idaho, or yeah. anything like that. But I want to so bad. I want to go to Idaho so bad. I don't know what oh, it is. Idaho is like calling me. <laughs> yeah. No, I've always wanted to go to Idaho too. We like drove through it when we were in Wyoming. We like went through the corner of it, but we didn't actually get to like go there and see all of Idaho. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, Idaho's uh, on the on my list of places to go. I I'm not as well traveled as either one of you. I've only the furthest west I've been has been Utah. That was for a conference, though, so I didn't have the opportunity to actually explore, which kind of sucked. Um, I had a, a group of friends. They ended up going to uh, Zion National Park, and I wanted to go so badly, but I had to present, and they're like, mm, "No, I don't think you should go." So I, I had to miss out on that trip. They showed me all the photos, and I was so jealous. I would have much rather skipped my presentation, but yeah, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> and then um, 
Ross and I, am, uh, we took a trip to New Mexico, which I guess would be traditionally considered southwestern, a southwestern state. But we were in Angel Fired, like maybe an hour or so from the Colorado border. And man, I remember that first, when we got there, it was, it was pitch black. So we couldn't really see anything. So I remember the next morning we woke up, my mom and dad had made some coffee. So I went downstairs, grabbed some coffee, and I walked out to the balcony. And you just see mountains everywhere. The sun like just about to peek over. And I was like, oh my God. It's just I mean, it's just gorgeous. Yeah. I that's probably the best cup of coffee I ever drank. It had nothing to do with the coffee. <laughs> yeah. oh, it was man. so nice. That trip was gorgeous. And then the palisades and everything and, and the cliff faces, red cliff faces going down to the river. It was absolutely yeah. gorgeous. I really liked New Mexico. Yeah. So yeah, you no. talked a little bit about hunting. Uh, is that something that you've grown up doing or what, what's your background in hunting? How'd you get started in that? So growing up, my mom's dad, my grandpa, he always hunted like him and all of his buddies. It was a big tradition. They would always whitetail hunt. So opening weekend for gun for whitetail, everyone would go to my grandpa's house and we have like a giant breakfast and lunch and they would all go out on my grandpa's property and they would hunt. So I kind of just always grew up kind of in that hunting atmosphere. And like, I always kind of knew that I wanted to hunt. So when I got old enough, I got my um, hunter's education and I started only whitetail hunting. And then I hunted for a few years. And then when I got into college, I kind of got out of it just because I was in the city. So it's kind of hard to, you know, balance hunting and, you know, being in college. So I kind of mm -hmm. stopped. And then once I graduated college, I kind of moved back home. And then, you know, I was back in the country, easier to go hunting and stuff like that. And then once I met my boyfriend, Jake, that's kind of when I really got into it because he's a big hunter. So it was kind of, you know, a better opportunity for me to learn more because growing up, I didn't have like a whole lot of teaching, you know, so I didn't know anything about like wind direction, scent, anything like that. So mm -hmm. having him teach me was kind of like, you know, it kind of opened my eyes to like, there's a lot that goes into it that I never knew about. So once I met him, I really got more involved in other kinds of hunting and other animals and stuff like that. I see. That's awesome. Yeah. I can only imagine trying to balance, you know, if you're in the city in college, you know, trying to, oh, well, I got to drive four hours this way to even try to find a hunt and try to be there before yeah. daybreak. Like I can imagine that would be tough. And so is it that I'm assuming that had a lot to do with why you ended up starting your own business in the first place. Yeah. So like the biggest part of it for me, like starting the own business was just like not having the freedom to be able to hunt. You know, it was like, obviously mm -hmm. I had like the afternoons and the weekends, but it's like everybody's out on the weekends, you know, like the weekdays here mm -hmm. are kind of like the best to hunt the woods because they're the least pressured. And so yeah. it was just like, you know, a whole, you know, not so much just like whitetail hunting, but like going out of state and stuff like that. Cause you know, like he goes out of state a lot. And so like, I couldn't go on those trips with him cause I'm like, Oh, I have to work and stuff like that. But now I have my own business. It's like, if I know ahead of time, I can play on like, Oh, you know, no orders for this week, no events. We're going out of town for a week or two. So it gives a lot more flexibility to just like, and you know, that's part of like my life. And it's like, for me, I don't want to not just do that doesn't make, you know, makes me happy. So it's like to be able to go out and do those things. It's like really living, you know, my fullest life. Right. And actually doing what you want to do, not what you just feel like you have to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not like, oh, you know, I can't go because I have to work. It's like, oh, let me, you know, take off for a week and we can go out of state, you know, go to Colorado or wherever we want to go, you know. That's awesome. So have you heard about the regulations going on next year with Colorado over the counter hunts and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we knew it was going to happen eventually. It was just a matter mm -hmm. of time kind of thing. But, you know, I see both sides of it. I know like a lot of residents are happy about it and I get it, but it's like being an out of stater and like those over the counter tags, it's like, you know, that hurts. But it, and it, it's like, it's getting harder every year to draw a tag. So it's like, that's kind of a backfall option. And I was like, you don't have that backfall option. Right. So is there any other backup, backup plans that y'all have? Y'all talked about going to any of the other states that still do over the counter? Or? No, really like Colorado is kind of like our, you know, Colorado is kind of like where we fall back on. So like last mm -hmm. year we drew muzzle tags for Colorado and that doesn't start until like the second or third week of, of September. So mm -hmm. we ended up going for an elk hunt first. So it's like we had that option to do the over-the-counter archery. And then this year we didn't draw any tags. So it's like Colorado is really the only option. So it's like to not have that option next year, It's if we don't draw anything, it's going to kind of suck, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Dang. Well, fingers crossed for y'all that y'all do draw something. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and like this year we missed our draw for our mule deer tag. So it's like 
they opened up a little bit later this year. So we're like, well, we have time. And then we went to go apply and it was already closed. So we're like, well, we, oh, you know, dropped the ball on that one. So it's like, you know, part of it, it's like, okay, you know, you got to be on top of it, but it's hard because we weren't sure exactly what we wanted to do as far as big game hunts go this year. So mm-hmm. it, we're kind of like wishy-washy about it. So we just weren't decisive enough to decide what we wanted to do until it was kind of too late to be like, oh, we already missed the mule deer. So we're kind of stuck with yeah. the over-the-count here. Man, that sucks. Is there any hunts that y'all been on that are just memorable that stick out to you? The first thing you think about doing a hunt abroad anywhere? We, so like as far as like hunts that we've done or that we want to do. Yeah, yeah, both. So like we both want to go to Alaska. He really wants to moose hunt. And I really want to mm-hmm. like caribou hunt, but all of the hunts that we've gone on, like we have so many memories and adventures, like on all of them, you know, whether it's like almost near the near, near death experiences or just like good memories, you know, we've had like a lot of, you know, like last year we were up in the mountains on our mule deer hunt and a storm came rolling in, like the storms come so fast out there. And so we're on rocks and there's no trees around. It's like all just a rock mountain. No, oh, and we're just we're stuck up there and we can see the lightning coming across and we're like we're gonna die so you know we're <laughs> freaking out and we're trying you know we can't get off the mountain because it's like the way we came up there's no path so it's like we're mm. stuck on this mountain so we tried to get down and we got into like a little rock depression but we're like lay on top of rocks in our tent and we can just like hear the lightning all around us and then it's starting to snow and we don't know how much snow is coming down so it's like you're just you're stuck there and it's like you don't know if you're going to get struck by lightning and like we had our muzzle loaders too. So we ended up ditching them on the mountain. We left them farther up on the mountain and, you know, we're 13,000 feet up. So it's like, you're the only thing that's around. So that was, you know, a scary experience that we always talk about, but we've got so many memories, but thankfully, you know, we made it through the night and there wasn't a lot of snow in the morning. So you're able to get down off the mountain after that. We're like, we're getting out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Did y'all end up going and getting the muzzle loaders? Uh, we got the muzzle loaders. They were fine. They didn't get struck by lightning, thankfully. But we, um, our plan was we were going to come up on this mountain and we're going to hook around because there was some mule deer on a little path up there. And we had seen them when we were glassing them one day. So we were going to work our way over to them. And we sat down for lunch. We were waiting for the winds to get right. And I'm like glassing to see if I see anything moving. And I look and I see and I'm like, Jake, I'm like, there's a guy out there. Has no orange on. He's just like in blue jeans. And he's like, there's no way there's a guy. He looks and sure enough, there's a guy. He's got his muzzleloader. He's got blue jeans. And I'm like, he's right where the deer was. And so we're like, well, oh, that, that deer, that deer's out of there. Next thing you know, we hear somebody shoot and then they start, you know, cheering. And I'm like, well, there goes our meal deer. So that yeah. was, you know, Dang. and it, it sucks because it's like we hiked up there. It took us like two days to get up there. And these guys just like, they beat us up the mountain on the other side and just shot the deer that we were after. And, you know, it's, it's part of it, but. It's like, it it sucks when you work so hard for it and then they just go and, you know, shoot them on you, but it's part of it. Yeah, that sucks. Is majority of the hunting y'all doing uh, just public land hunts? Yeah. So here in New York, uh, it's just permission. Basically, we don't have any property of our own. So we ask Mm -hmm. private landowners to hunt on their property. But then when we go out of state, it's all public land. So, you know, we will sometimes, depending on what we're hunting, we'll try and get private permission. So like for Ohio, for deer. I just hunt like private land for permission. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, for Turkey, we did a mixture of both private land, public land. So it kind of depends on what we're after. Um, But a lot of it is public land hunting. That's awesome. So speaking of Turkey, it looks like you had a busy Turkey season this past season. Yeah. Yeah. This, um, this is my most turkeys that I've ever gotten this past year. And, you know, we started off in Kentucky and Kentucky, we were like, well, we'll do, public land and then we're like well we'll drive around and we'll try and find some birds on private land so we drove around we were asking permission and it was probably the hardest state to get permission in like usually we'll go like every like five or ten houses and we'll get at least one yes we probably had 40 to 50 houses before we got a single yes because they were like every out there everybody hunts or they have everything leased out like everything a lot of it was leasing so you know, we I drove see. by this one field and there was like 10 times out in the field. And so we're like, oh, this is like, it's perfect. You know, we went, we went and we asked and like, oh, it's already leased out. So that one was hard. We, we ended up starting opening day on public land and we heard a bunch of birds, but there was just guys everywhere. So we didn't get anything opening day. We ended up getting both of our birds on private land. We got permission. Um, so my bird, we drove by and we saw him out in the field 
we went over and we asked the landowner and he was like, yeah, I have Adam. So thankfully, you know, we used the, the turkey fans, the reapers, and uh, he came right in. So it was like, you know, it worked out perfectly. But it's like when you're going, you're asking permission, everyone's shutting you down. It gets really discouraging. I can imagine. So what does that look like? I've never gone and asked for permission on private land before. You just go and door knock or? Yeah. So we drive up to the door and we'll knock and we introduce ourselves. And then we basically just kind of cut to the point and tell them, you know, what we're there for. And so we always start off with, you know, we just try and start off being friendly. You know, we'll be like, hey, how's mm-hmm. it going? You know, try and be really nice. We tell them who we are and tell them like the purpose that we're there for. So we're like, tell them that we're there to hunt turkey. Um, and usually people, you know, some people are nice about it and some people are like, absolutely not, you know, don't want anything to yeah. do with you. I've had people that like won't even open the door and just like talk to me through the door because they don't want anything to do with you. So some yeah. people are really nice about it. And my boyfriend's really good at it. People love talking to him. Like they'll, get, they'll tell him no. And then he'll be there for 20 minutes talking to him. And I'm like, well, did, <laughs> did they say yes? And like, no, they said no. I'm like, well, you're standing there talking to him for so long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, awesome. so we do a lot of like permission based. So in here in New York, everything that I hunt is, you know, private grounds. It's all permission based. So I do have other guys that hunt the land, which kind of, you know, it's kind of like you're hunting public land when there's other guys on it, even though it is private yeah. land. So it's like you still have that competition of other hunters, but at least it's like a little more safer than hunting public land, you know, especially like with right. turkeys. When we go on to hunt turkeys in public land, it's like, you know, a lot of people get shot during turkey season because people don't pay that much attention. So it's like being yeah. on public land and hunting turkeys. It's like you're always kind of on edge to be like, is there somebody else in the woods with me? Like you don't know because obviously everyone's dressed in camo. It's harder to see. Yeah, the guest that we had on from uh, New York previously was talking about him getting shot at during turkey season. Oh, time, really? Right? And he was on property. It was private property that he was the only one with permission to. And That's somebody crazy. else was out there poaching on the other side of the hill, shooting at the same turkey that he was. And he was directly across. And I was just like, oh. and me and Jose have been peppered a few times out there dove hunting on public land in Texas. Oh, really? Um, but nothing ever like severe or anything like that. But it's definitely. Yeah. It's scary. <laughs> oh, yeah. sure. Terrifying. How was dove hunting? Oh, it's so much fun. Oh, yeah. It's a blast. <clears throat> not trying to, uh, no pun intended, but it is quite <laughs> fun. <laughs> it it uh, depends on the day though. I mean, some days there's been days where we're out there and they're flying a mile high and obviously you're not using like a full choke or anything like that. Cause they're a fairly small bird. So, yeah. um, when they're flying high, it's basically like, you're not really going to get anything. You're just kind of shooting at clouds. Um, there was one day that me and me and Jose, we were out there for what, maybe three or four hours and didn't see one bird. And yep. we got so bored, we just started skeet shooting with cow <laughs> <laughs> It was just, we had nothing else coming through. Uh, and it was hot that day. Um, so it can be fun. Uh, sometimes it's just about the experience, but it, yeah. it's a blast. And dove are so good. You make dove poppers yeah. wrapped in bacon with jalapeno and cream cheese and throw them that on the grill. That sounds good. Mm-hmm. Amazing. See, in, in South Texas, I spent a lot, I spent about six and a half years in South Texas. I attended a smaller university down there. And uh, it's like, South Texas is like the dove capital of Texas. I mean, people come from all over the place to go hunting over there. There's even, I, I don't know if they still do it, but in Kingsville, the town of Kingsville, there used to be um, Fiesta de la Paloma or something like that, which essentially just means like um, the dove festival. And so there's like a whole thing just kind of dedicated to the culture of dove hunting in South Texas. It's pretty awesome. That's cool. And um, there were, there used to be quite a bit of public land around. So, um, there's actually, I mean, there's one maybe like five minutes just outside of city limits. And so my buddies and I, we drive down there like first thing in the morning before class, opening day of dove season. And we'd sit out there and we'd try, you know, we'd just be out there until class comes. Sometimes we'd even skip class, whatever, you know. <laughs> and then we'd go and, so, and we'd just walk into class like all camo and everything like that and covered in feathers. And people know, but, you know, yeah. it's what it is. And so we, we go about our day. And then as soon as we're done, we're all done with class, we go back out to the field. And uh, awesome. it was just awesome. Yeah, it was it was so much fun so much fun dove hunting down there public land dove hunting can be tough there are certain units that are better than others but we've we're lo- we were lucky enough to stumble upon quite a few that were really 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 good that produced pretty well and russell came down because i was sending him pictures all the time he goes dude i'm gonna go down there we're gonna spend one day fishing we're gonna spend the next day hunting and we're gonna watch the longhorn games they're both longhorn fans we're like heck yeah dude let's go Oh, the Cowboys too. Yeah. So we, he drove down, which is about three and a half hours from where he was. 
we get in and we try and go fishing at the coast, but red tide was happening and the fishing was exi- like non-existent. So we couldn't even do that. We go to watch the Longhorns play and they lost. <laughs> so the next day we tried to go dove hunting and we didn't see it. We went in the morning. We didn't see a single bird. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we went and had lunch, and then I think we were going to watch the Cowboys play, and they lost. And Russell's like, dude, I'm just going to go home. I was like, all right, man. <laughs> so he he left. I mean, like everything we were, like we had such high hopes for just failed. And then I had some time in the evening. I was like, man, I'm just going to go dove hunting. So I went with like two of my buddies. after I left. Yeah, and I got my limit of dove. <laughs> so I sent a picture of Russell. He goes, dude, what the hell, man? I was like, you left too early. <laughs> I was like an hour away and he limited it out. And I was like, dude, I would have stayed an hour for a little bit of dub. <laughs> oh, man, it was, it was, it was hilarious. But it was a good time. Like, I've, I, I love dub hunting. It's, it's, it's a lot, a lot of fun. It is for sure. That have you ever done any, any dub hunting? No, we've done, I've just done Canadian geese. Uh, uh-huh. But other than that, not really any other waterfowl or anything like that. I see. Yeah, I've never done any dub hunting, which, I mean, I live, two hours away from the duck hunting capital of the world. I needed to go. Um, but I've never done the only waterfowl hunt is I did a snow goose conservation hunt last year oh, okay. or earlier this year. That was fun. It could have turned out a lot better for me if I would have showed up on time, um, <laughs> but I still got like five birds and That's good. I made fajitas out of, out of one of them. And, um, what else did I make? I made something else. Did you make a stir fry or something? I don't remember what I made. I made a cooking video. I just never posted it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to remember, but yeah, I made fajitas and um, I don't remember what the other thing was, but everybody was saying, oh, snow goose doesn't really taste that good. I really enjoyed it. My kids ate it and everything. So I, I enjoyed it, but I've never had Canadian geese. Yeah, we've cooked, we've cooked that. I've cooked it a little bit, um, mm-hmm. but I only made like a pulled pork kind of thing with it. So I put it in the crock pot and then I shredded it up and, I thought it tasted pretty good. I think I overcooked it a little bit, but I was watching some videos on how to cook it and they were saying kind of cook, to cook it like a steak. You want it almost like rare in the middle and that way mm-hmm. it stays like it tastes better. So I've asked them in the freezer that I'm going to cook, cook up, but sometimes the guys that we go with, they save it and they give it to their dogs and stuff like that for dog yeah. food. So whenever we go with other people, we kind of split it up who gets what birds. So. I see. That makes sense. That's yeah. what I did with the other one is I made like pulled pork sandwiches with it and it came out really good. And I just put yeah. it on um, like King's Hawaiian buns with some barbecue mm-hmm. sauce and some sliced pickles. It was really good. Yeah. So, so I've, I've never gone goose hunting, but uh, living close to the Texas coast, when we weren't dove hunting and we weren't fishing, we were duck hunting when we could. But it was mostly divers. We were shooting a lot of uh, a lot of redheads out there in, on, on the Corpus Christi Bay. Mm-hmm. And um a lot of folks didn't like it. They say divers in particular were just like terrible, but I, I never had a bad one. Like I thought it was great. And kind of like you were saying, all I did was cook it like a steak, just you mm-hmm. know, rare to medium rare in the middle. And it was fantastic. It was really, really good. Yeah. But it's, it's kind of one of those things where it's really duck meat's really interesting. Like if I feel like it's very easy to mess up, if you overcook it, the texture just totally changes. Mm-hmm. The taste totally changes. It's almost like livery and could like consistency and taste almost if you overcook it. So you have like a really fine line to get it just right or it's like, it's not good. So I feel like a lot of people who say it wasn't good, just they just overcooked it. They just didn't cook it right. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. That, that was my experience with the snow goose as well. Every, I mean, even the guys that I was with it, there was a group that we were supposed to be there with and they got 382 birds oh, between wow. 15 guys. That's I mean, it crazy. was nuts. It was this huge flock and uh, we were literally on the dirt road pulling up to them when they shot. Like, we, we were barely <laughs> too late. Um, but a majority of them were same thing. Oh, they're going to give to the dogs. They're going to do this. They're going to do that with it. But majority of them are like, oh, it's not even really that good of meat. It's just fun to do. And I'm like, give me all the birds. I'll eat them all. I'll eat anything. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'm hoping this year I'll get to go out and do, do another conservation hunt um but yeah it's it all depends on how you cook it and i love cooking so i lived on youtube for like days before the hunt like how am i gonna cook these and i took a poll on on our instagram asking you know viewers and stuff how they wanted you know to see me make it and all that stuff and so i got a lot of ideas that way but yeah from what i've seen it all depends on how you cook it yeah so if you had to choose between hunting birds or big game what would you choose big game (laughs) <laughs> i think that's an easy question to answer <laughs> it's like i like i like the canadian geese and stuff like that it's fun but it's like it also gets frustrating like we had 
an experience this past fall or like kind of winter, I should say, where we had a good setup and there was birds, but we were using like the silhouettes. Mm -hmm. And so once they come over top of them, they can see that it's not a real goose and then they would fly yeah. away. So it was like, you know, we saw a lot. So it's like in, in, in instances like that, it gets frustrating. And mm -hmm. since I'm new to need like to goose hunting and waterfowl and stuff like that, you know, I'm still practicing getting better at that kind of shooting. So for me, it's like, I'm still learning it. So it is a lot of fun, but I like to be constantly moving. So that's why I like the big game. It's like, you're constantly mm -hmm. kind of like more of that stock and chase with like Turkey and stuff like that. So for like yeah. the elk and the mule deer, it's like, you're constantly moving and doing something, which I kind of like better than just sitting there waiting for something to come to me. Right. And there's a lot of hunting in the South where people just sit in blinds and I've been invited a few times and I, I'll, I'll decline some hunts like that just because I'm not a big hunter. So it's not like I'm experienced anyways. So it's not like I'm going to walk out in the woods and be able to stalk a deer first try, <laughs> but that's just more appealing to me than going and sitting in a box and waiting for someone to come eat some corn. And yeah, you know, that's just not yeah. my, it's not sportsman enough for me, I guess. It doesn't really appeal to me. So I'm very similar to you in that aspect. Yeah. It's more like that kind of like cat and mouse game of like, you know, chasing, you know, the animal and not like chasing, but you know, it's more skill when you're spotting and stalking. Oh, for sure. I used to feel that way. And I, I still do to some extent, but I think over the years of like, just talking to folks and, and kind of really thinking about it. I think one thing, if there is something to say about blind hunting, especially in Texas, cause that's like pretty much the hunting culture here. It's like, everyone's got a blind, everyone's got feeders and all that stuff. And everyone kind of, you know, they have their um, opinions on Texas hunting and stuff. And I, and I, and I totally get it. And, and I share the same sentiment to some degree, but I think over the years I've come to kind of understand it from a different perspective. Like I feel one thing, if there's anything to say about it, that blind hunting does offer you. Um, it allows you to really kind of observe the animal. Like you don't have to take it, you know, you can sit there, you can watch them. You can learn a lot from the, about their behavior. You can learn a lot about the individuals because, I mean, they are very, uh, well, I think. they And we're, <laughs> we're taught in, in college not to anthropomorphize like uh, deer and things like that. And, and really, we're not supposed to. But they do like individually seem to have or display some kind of differences in personality. So it's really mm -hmm. cool to kind of be able to see those little nuances, you know, that you may not get to appreciate whenever you're spot and stalking because you're um, – I mean, like I've never done it, but it's just like in theory, conceptually, you know, like if, if you see an animal, you have to kind of plan it. And then once you get close, you know, you only have a certain amount of time to um, execute the the shot or get in a position or whatever before things, you know, start getting intense. But at least from the blind, you know, you get to actually kind of watch and, and observe, um, whereas you may not be able to uh, otherwise. And then in addition to that, it can allow you to be a bit more selective. So if you're trying to, um, you know, manage like the age structure and, and the uh, buck to doe ratio and stuff like that, it allows you to do those things. So I think, I think my perspective on blind hunting in particular over the last few years has kind of changed a little bit. Like I don't, I used to be pretty like against it, even though I have, like I felt conflicted nowadays, like. I still, I think I, I, I don't mind it at all. Um, I think I, I, I still do it. I just, I think now I'm just going to try and be a bit, um, more patient, you know, and, and allow and, and kind of immerse myself more in the actual act of, of like observation. And I think that's something that kind of people might overlook at times. Um, and it is not as exciting. I imagine as Western style hunting, but I think it is, it, it has some, I guess some, some pros, you know, some things that maybe some folks might overlook to some yeah. degree anyway. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. Just from, you know, here in New York, when I hunt whitetail and stuff like that, I don't usually sit in the blind, but I'm still using a tree stand. So it's still kind of that same observation. So it is kind of cool to see, you know, how the deer move and why they move in a certain way. And it is cool because you get to see all the different kinds of, you know, you get to see big does, small does, different kinds of bucks and stuff like that. And that's like one of the advantages too, to like earlier hunting and bow season is the deer are so much more active versus mm -hmm. like when it gets into like the late winter and stuff like that, you don't see as much movement. So it is cool to be able to observe them 
when they're more active in a tree stand and they, you know, hopefully don't know that you're there is the goal, but <laughs> it's, it's cool yeah. to see them and to watch them and, you know, see them move certain ways and kind of figure out why they're moving that way. Absolutely. There's just something about watching a species in its, in its natural habitat, just doing what it does. That's so majestic and peaceful. Yeah. Yeah. They're smart critters. Like a lot of people don't, I guess, give them the credit, but they are in- extremely intelligent, very funny. Like, I don't know. We used to have some deer pins out in Kingsville and uh, they would do some like small scale studies and stuff. And I got to go out there a few times and I was sometimes I'll just sit there and I'll just watch them. And man, they are characters. Like it's, <laughs> it's pretty awesome. But anyways, off topic. So <laughs> Kayla, <laughs> so throughout this conversation so far, I've heard you mention, you know, you've, you've hunted different species across many different States. Um, you've mentioned muzzleloaders, rifles and bows. So I know, like there are a lot of hunters and fishermen out there who kind of they really like to focus on a particular species or a particular method. Um, for you, is it is it more like do you have something like that, or is it more of the actual just the act of hunting that kind of drives you? It doesn't necessarily matter what it might be versus you know whether it's the method or the animal, but is it just like just being out there and, and actually doing it that kind of drives you? Yeah, it's more just like being out there and just doing the actual hunting you know for me it's like I didn't used to bow hunt I just started bow hunting in the past like you know three to four years so bow hunting is still new to me but I kind of tend to like the bow hunting more than gun hunting just because for like deer let's say they're so much more active once you get into gun season the deer they know they catch on they're smart and you don't see anything so you know there's pros and cons to every season Gun hunting, obviously, it's a lot easier because you can shoot farther and, you know, you have more of knockdown power. Obviously, being like a female, I can't draw as much, you know, my draw weight is less and I have a shorter draw than a guy, let's say. So they have a better chance of killing and, you know, I have to be more accurate with my shot since I don't have as much force going behind my arrow. So I like the bow hunting because, you know, it is more of that stalk and spot for, let's say, like elk and mule deer and, you know, and here in New York, during bow season for white-tailed deer, they're so much more active. But it's like just overall, I love the hunting in general. So I'm not too particular about whether it's, you know, rifle or muzzleloader or, you know, bow. I've actually, for Christmas, uh, like two or three years ago, Jake got me a muzzleloader. And that's probably what I've shot most of my deer with was my muzzleloader, you know. So I really love the muzzleloader, but it's like I like the bow hunting for the aspect of like the animals are more active and you get to see more. So it's like when you're sitting out there, you might only see two or three deer. It's like not as enjoyable as when you're seeing 10 or 20 deer coming out into the field or walking through the woods and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I tend to lean more towards liking the bow hunting and it gives you something to do during summertime too, because you can practice a lot. So mm-hmm. it's more active and it's more involved, but it definitely, it takes a lot more skill too. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And so you talked about, obviously, you know, you are a female. Have you faced any challenges other than, of course, you know, your drawback strength and stuff like that in being a female in the hunting scope? Um, you know, not really. You know, I feel like nowadays it's gotten a lot more common where females are hunters. So mm-hmm. I remember like when I first started hunting, I would go to like Cabela's to get my tags. People would like think that I was in the wrong checkout line. Like they'd be like, oh, like the checkout <laughs> line's over there. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm getting my hunting license. Like I'm supposed to be here. So that <laughs> yeah. kind of like, it just makes me laugh. And But like nowadays it is more common. You know, it's not so, you know, weird to see people like females hunting. Um, mm-hmm. It definitely is a little bit harder to keep up with my boyfriend when we're out in the mountains because he's a lot taller obviously so it's like for him (laughs) hiking and walking like he'll be way ahead of me and I'm like hey wait up for me you know so it's like (laughs) I do my best to keep up with him um you know and he waits for me and stuff like that but it's like you know sometimes I feel like I'm holding him back because I can only go so far at one time but it's like I do my best to keep up with him and he does his best to stay you know take breaks for me but it's like I'll get up to him and he'll be like, okay, it breaks over. And I'm like, I need a break now. (laughs) But, um, (laughs) oh yeah. So, you know, other than that, you know, I don't really find too many challenges with it. Um, I, I do my best to try and keep up and I keep up like my strength by working out for like bow season and stuff like that. So there really hasn't been too many challenges that I've encountered, but I just try and do my best to keep up with the guys kind of thing, you know? Right. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I have noticed that there's a lot more women. Well, I'm, I'm not out there in the woods seeing as much, but I've noticed on social media, it seems like there's more women that are getting into the sport, which is weird because like statistically the, 
rate of hunters is declining. You know, yeah. there's not as many people getting out in the woods uh, as there was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And so I wonder if we're just seeing more of it due to social media or if there actually are starting to be in more of an evening out of women and men in the sport. Yeah, I think a lot of it is social media because like, I think part of it is like, people that have an interest in it, they see a female hunter and say like, Oh, I can do that. And Mm -hmm. I think part of like the reason for the decline is like if people go out there and they don't have anyone to like kind of mentor them, it can get frustrating. If you don't know what you're doing and you're not seeing anything, you're not getting anything. Like I used to be in a couple groups on Facebook and I'd see people that are like, Oh, you know, females and they've been hunting for 10 years and they've never gotten a deer in their life because they don't have anyone to show them. So it's like, Oh, Mm -hmm. I'm giving up. I'm quitting. And it's because they don't have anyone to kind of show them the rope. So yeah, I think having a mentor and somebody to show you what to do kind of helps people to stay more involved in it. But I do think social media plays a big role in people wanting to hunt because they see, you know, when they see that success and that harvest, they're like, oh, I want to do that too. That looks fun. But I think a lot mm-hmm. of people don't realize like how much work actually goes into it, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, it's Absolutely. fun and it looks cool, but it's like, okay, it, it takes a lot of work to get everything. And like for us, we don't use any like kind of like outfitters or pack system. So it's like, when we kill an elk, we're taking that out ourselves. And it's like, it's, you know, fun until they get down. And like this year was my first elk pack out. And it was definitely, it was, it was, it was definitely challenging. You know, I said, I don't think people like realize how much work it is to get that elk off the mountain. Especially if you're out on public lands, a lot of that you're having to pack it by foot. You're not getting a side by side or a four wheeler out there. And yeah, we had a guy that we grew up with that was on, and he's a big time elk hunter up in Colorado. And he says that sometimes it takes three, four days just to pack the animal out. You know? Yeah, yeah. It took us two days. Um, the elk that we shot was like up over the mountain that we were on, so we had that the first mm-hmm. day we hiked it up to the top of the mountain, and then the next day we hiked it down to the truck. So thankfully, like it wasn't a super big mountain that we were on definitely been on bigger ranges we've been farther in there so thankfully it wasn't like too far and the first day getting it up onto the mountain wasn't terrible but then Mm -hmm. getting it back down it was like we just packed everything on there so it was like just a lot of like pain on your shoulders like that just that weight pushing down on you that's what kind of like killed me I was like I want to get off this mountain (laughs) (laughs) so so how much weight do you think it was like in total getting that that animal off the mountain I I have no idea, honestly. Like usually, typically, I think my pack is probably like around 40 to 50 pounds and it was heavier than that. So I'd probably say like I maybe had like 60-ish pounds on my back and then my boyfriend had even, like I had the delicate meat. So I had like the back straps (laughs) and the tenderloins and I had the head where he has, he had like all the thighs and stuff like that. So he had the majority of the weight. So he was definitely feeling it more than I was, but he was just like, you know, he had a smile on his face and he didn't care about the weight. He was just like happy to have his elk and happy we got one. So he was like, I don't care about the pain. He was just, you know, (laughs) enjoying the moment. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. So I I guess, so going into that, what kind of preparation do y'all do for, uh, what's the saw hunt? Like, like physical preparation and mental preparation. So, physically like I just work out all year round you know it's just like something that I enjoy doing in general so I'm constantly working out you know I'm, we both like he works construction so he's constantly like lifting heavy stuff and he works out too so it's like we're both very physically active um, but when it gets closer to actual like hunting season I'll do a lot more like walking hiking kind of stair climber stuff um, but like a big part of it, like you said like mentally it is a lot of mental stuff because it's like a mental challenge to be able to like push yourself to keep going because there is days where like, you know, it's, it gets really hot. So it's like when you have all that weight on your back and you're walking in the, up the mountain and you're getting tired, it's like, you have to keep, you know, mentally reminding yourself to keep going. So it definitely helps having somebody there with you and you're hunting and like hiking like that in the back country to kind of push yourself. And, um, like I can't imagine doing it alone just because like having Jake there, it is kind of nice to have that, you know, extra little push to be like, okay, we have a little bit longer, you know, kind of just to keep your spirits up. So I can't imagine like doing it alone. Like I feel like it definitely would be more of a mental challenge, but right. Yeah. And that's one thing. I mean, you know, if you're going on a walk, it's one thing, but if you're, you know, thousands of feet up a mountain, it's not like it's easy just to get back. So you yeah. have to mentally prepare to be like, Oh, well I'm getting to that peak and I'm getting down that other side. I can't even imagine. And then it taken days to do it, you know, <laughs> on top of that. So yeah, there's like last year, 
before we got caught in the thunderstorm to get up there. So like there was no trail. So it was like completely just bushwhacking and the mount, the whole entire mountain was very cliffy. There wasn't a lot, whole lot of trees. And so there was like large slabs of rock too. So getting up there, it was like, you're just looking at it and seeing how steep it was. And it was like, we were both kind of like, at first I was kind of like, eh, I don't know about this. And he was like, no, it'll be fine. I promise. And then at one point he was like, he was kind of nervous about it. And so I was like, no, like, it'll be fine. So it's just kind of like that constant, like pushing each other. And we, you know, we agree. We'll always be like, if we don't feel comfortable about it, we're not going to do it, you know, just because it's like, it's not worth getting hurt over. We always say like an animal isn't worth getting hurt over. So we do kind of, you know, we keep each other in check, you know, we motivate each other to keep going, but we're also like, okay, if like you're too scared, you don't feel comfortable, then we won't do it. And it's as simple as that. But, you know, we we always kind of figure out the best way up the mountain together. We'll look at it and say, okay, what's the best way? What's the safest way, you know, to get up this mountain without having a path? Cause it's like, you really do have to look at it and figure out what's our safest bet to get up this mountain without hurting ourselves or getting ourselves killed. Cause it's like out there it is, it's a matter of life and death. It's like one wrong move and you could be, you know, falling off that mountain and there's nobody really around to help you. And if it's rocks, you know, you hit your head and you're kind of done for. So the guy that we had on that uh, does a lot of hunting in Colorado, he had mentioned something about there's an insurance policy you can get where you can get airlifted out and, st- and stuff like that. So obviously, I know there's one in Colorado. Do you know of anything like that in any of the other states that y'all hunt? No, I have heard about I have heard about it in Colorado. Actually, my boyfriend's friend, he had to get he like kind of got lost. They were hunting together and they had a little bit of a mix up about like, where they were going to meet up. So my boyfriend went to look for his friend cause he wasn't up on top of the mountain yet. So he went down to look for him. He didn't see him. On, he didn't see him on like the side of the mountain. So he went back to town while his friend went up to the top of the mountain and was waiting for him. So they called like search and rescue and stuff like that. And he was fine. He was there. Like he wasn't lost. He was just waiting for him, which was good. You know, he stayed where he was supposed to, but I know they yeah. do have like things like that where it's like, you know, search and rescue will come out for you and it's like no additional charge. But as far yeah. as like, the Western states. I don't know of any other states that kind of do something like that. Yeah. I heard about that when he was talking about it. I was like, that is odd. Like that's, I didn't even know that was a thing, but definitely could be life and death. And he was telling us a story about um, some guys that went out on one of their first hunts with him and it was their first hunt. And uh, they ended up having to get, you know, life flighted out because they were damn near dehydrated in, in a Valley where they thought there was going to be water and there wasn't. And yeah, apparently it turned into this bad situation. So I can only imagine. Yeah, that's a big thing out there is like making sure that you have enough food and water. And we always like we'll look at the maps beforehand and say, okay, like there should be water here. So whenever we get to a spot, we always mark down. We use Onyx a lot for like tracking all of our camping spots and water and stuff like that. So we'll look for water locations first. So that way we can say like, okay, if there's supposed to be water here and there's not, at least we know like where the last spot we found water was. So we use like the gravity filter bags and we filter our water that way, just make sure that they're safe for drinking while we're up on the mountain. But yeah, yeah, definitely having water. It's, you know, and sometimes we get to places and the water isn't super close, but it's like, you do have to hike a mile for the water, but we'll like fill up a bunch of bags that way we have it at camp with us. But there definitely yeah. have been times where like we're hiking and we drink all wa- all of our water and like I get cranky because I'm like, okay, I'm getting hot. Now I'm getting thirsty. <laughs> I'm like, I need a water break. <laughs> <laughs> i'm the same way or when i get hungry i'm one of those that i get extremely hangry <laughs> yeah we, we make sure we have snacks so that way when we're hiking we're not getting you know too hungry <laughs> right so do y'all have any upcoming hunts that y'all are excited about um so we're doing elk hunt this year we're going for the over the counter in colorado since it's the last year for it so yeah. we're both gonna you know and it's good too because it's like when you do more than one hunt it's like you kind of aren't as focused because you're thinking about, okay, I only have so much time to hunt this animal where it's like, okay, the elk is our only focus this year. So we have a couple of weeks to try and get an elk for both of us. So Mm -hmm. last year when we got the elk, it's like, it took us two days to get it off the mountain. So it's like, at that point we had to drive to our next location for our mule deer hunt. So it doesn't give you a whole lot of time. So we have our elk hunt this year. I'm excited about it because that way we'll both have like a fair chance to both try and get an elk and you know, it is a lot of work and it's a lot of meat that we don't really need all that meat, but we'll give away a lot to like friends and family and stuff like that. So, yeah. yeah. But yeah, Man, it'll, lucky it'll friends fun. and family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We got a lot last year. We got our elk processed out there. So we got a lot of elk sausages made. So we had like Italian sausage and breakfast sausage and stuff like that. But it took, it, it was like a whole freezer that it took up for all the elk meat. So <laughs> it definitely is a lot. So, 
at this point we're just like we're getting ready now obviously now like we're gearing towards hunting season so we're kind of just like giving it away to whoever wants it because it's like okay mm. next hunting season's coming up we need more some more room in the freezer <laughs> <laughs> right nice so is there a state that y'all have not yet hunted that y'all would really like to i know y'all mentioned alaska but i guess within the lower 48 so i haven't hunted montana at all like i would really like to hunt montana i know they have really good elk hunting there i haven't had a chance to hunt there he's hunted there before but i haven't had a chance to hunt there so i'd really like to hunt montana um for him he's hunted kind of all over so i think for him like alaska is kind of the next step but for me i'd really be interested yeah (laughs) but um (laughs) yeah for me i think i know that he's hunted in montana for elk and he's gotten some big, big elk there and i know they have a really good elk population and they're pretty big up there so i'd like to go there and try and get an elk but I know that the draw for there is getting harder too. So it's kind of a mm-hmm. waiting game for that. So and I know like the tags right. there too, they are pretty pricey. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm from Alaska originally. And so oh, really? I know a lot of people that hunt up there. I've never been hunting up there. I've been fishing up there a lot. Um, but my uncle used to go archery for moose and mm-hmm. I couldn't even imagine the stress of having an animal that big just there. And all you have is, I mean, of course you have a sidearm, but just, have you know your bow drawn it's like i think my uncle t- was telling me one time that he actually had a uh, a cow come up and basically sniff the end of his arrow and he's just there and i'm just like i would be frozen with fear like what do you do in that situation because there's no way that you're protecting yourself when she's that close yeah no it's funny that you say that because we actually last year in colorado we were sleeping and the mountain that we were on it always blew the same direction like the wind was never it never changed it was always blowing the same way and so we were mm-hmm. laying there and like, I'm just about to fall asleep. And Jake goes, he's like, I just heard a bugle. And I was like, are you sure? I'm like, are you falling asleep? He's like, no, no, no. He's like, I just heard it. He's like, it's like a hundred yards away. And I'm like, okay, well, like it's nighttime. We can't do anything about it now. You know, I'm like, let's go back to sleep. And so we hear this noise, like this, like breaking of branches. And I'm like, did you hear that? And he's like, yeah. And the next thing, you know, like I like, it was this, it was the weirdest experience ever. It was like almost like an out of body experience. Like I could feel something like stepping on the ground and I was like, something's up here with us. Like I could just, you could, you could just like sense it almost, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And next thing you know, we hear like this, like super loud breathing up against the tent. And I was like, I froze for a minute. <laughs> it was on my side, of course. And I was like, I froze. I was like, what do I do? And he thought it was a bear. So he like screamed. He's like, get out of here. And it was an elk. It came up to the tent. It didn't know what we were because he couldn't, like the wind was blowing the other way. So he came up on the one side and couldn't smell us. He came out and he was smelling the tent and we could hear him like running away and his like antlers were breaking the branches. I go out there in the morning, like there's little like hoof prints all over. I was like, you scared our elk away. (laughs) (laughs) Damn, that's crazy. That would scare me. I mean, even if I knew what it was, that's a, that's a big animal and you're asleep and just held, you know, (laughs) a little bit of nylon between y'all. Yeah. There's not much. It's like, okay. It's like, it's like, is it a bear or what is it? You know? And it's, so it's like that moment of like, obviously like we have bear spray and stuff like that, but it's like, you just like freeze. It's like, what do you do? And like, thanks like he reacted faster than I did. Cause I'm like, if it was a bear, I would have gotten eaten. <laughs> <laughs> and you got to wow. be mentally prepared for that. I remember, I guess it was two years ago. I was up in Alaska. And uh, so in the summertime up there, it's daylight pretty much all, all day around. Mm-hmm. And no, uh, it was like midnight. We're out there fishing at a place called Tanana lakes. And I grew up in Texas, so I'm not, I never think about bears, you know, and, um, have you ever seen that video where he's like, Hey, what's your name? And then he's like, Tony, what's yours? <laughs> so we were doing that cause we were with my, my brother's friend whose name was Tony. And, um, so I'd walked uh, around one of the little fingers of the lake. And so I was probably maybe two or 300 yards away from them. And it's kind of dusky outside. The sun's still kind of barely behind the trees and so it's light enough but it was like midnight maybe one in the morning and i was like waving across the lake and we were doing that little skit and it was just kind of funny well then they picked up and they started walking around the lake picked up all their stuff we're going around and i was like well i'm gonna go hide in the woods and so i'm just like (laughs) covered up in all these bushes laying in the woods and everything and they walk past me and get to the other side and they're like where did he go and then i'm back where they started and i do it again and they're like how the hell did he get over there and i go back and i hide in the woods again and it was funny. I didn't think nothing of it. Well, then we got back and I was telling my stepmom about it. And she's like, a family died last year because they like bears were out there in those woods and chased them into the lake or whatever. And they couldn't get out of the lake and they drowned or something like that. And I was like, oh, like I didn't think about that. She's like, did you at least have a gun? I said, no, I'm just walking <laughs> around out there with my fly rod, you know, <laughs> just off in the woods. Didn't even yeah, think yeah. about it. I could have been eaten up by a bear. 
That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, the bears up there are crazy. That's the one thing about like I want to hunt in Alaska, but with the bears, it's like a whole nother level because those grizzlies, they're just they're nasty. Yeah. Have you heard the? Uh, have you heard of Bee Eater by chance? Oh yeah. Have you heard that episode? Uh, was it the the, the bear tree? Bear. The the meat tree? Yeah, on a fo- mm-hmm. and a fog neck island. Fog neck. No. Yeah, that's a crazy story. You got to give that one a listen. Yeah, yeah I'll these check dudes. It out. I, I pretty much. I'll just give you like the the uh, summary, I guess, yeah. Cliff Notes version, if you will. These dudes hunted a fog neck. Apparently, a fog neck. They had an introduced elk herd, and they've they've done really well. And the, some of the biggest bodied elk in the world, like. They say they can get over a thousand pounds or something like that. So, I guess because of that, the grizzlies on that island are also equally large, like huge, massive mm-hmm. grizzlies. And um, they ended up, you know, shooting this elk, and uh, it was like on this really, really nasty spot. So they ended up just hanging it in the tree, and they're going to go back and and get the rest of the meat. So they went, and they were walking. They noticed like some bear scat and signs and stuff. I'm like, okay. And they hadn't seen one all trip, mm-hmm. uh, if, I remember, if I remember correctly. And uh, yeah, so essentially they go to the meat tree and, and you know, they put their guns down. They're all just kind of hanging out, trying to get this, this, uh, all the meat down and everything. And they normally are, are pretty, uh, like, I guess, alert when they're trying to do something like that. And for whatever reason, stuff just, they just weren't. And it was just like a, a perfect, cocktail of everything that you shouldn't do in a place where there's grizzlies around and yeah. it got a little it got a little western for them i don't want to ruin it for you so <laughs> i'll just leave it just yeah. leave it there but it's, it's, it's a good listen it's it's, yeah. it's pretty crazy I think, I think it's a two-part it's a two-part deal and it's pretty cool because they go like there's multiple people there on the podcast who were all there for that and they kind of go and they give their own account it's really really interesting listen it's like it's like damn it's kind of scary kind yeah. of terrifying i'll have to check it out but yeah, no, the bears yeah. are definitely like when you're out there, you're definitely kind of on edge because it's like anything can happen at any time. Yeah, absolutely. It's crazy yeah. how for like how large of an animal they are, how well they hide. Like you just can't see them till they're on you, pretty much. It's yeah, terrifying. Yeah, we went. There was one spot that we camped when we were in Colorado, and the water was like kind of down off the side of the mountain, so we had to hike down. It was like about a mile hike to the water. But all around the water edge was like these big bushes and it was like perfect for a bear. So it was like we're walking down there and you're, you know, you don't know what's hiding down there. So it's like, mm-hmm. you know, you're trying to make noise to make sure nothing's around there. But it's like at the same time, it's like it's a perfect spot for a bear. You know, they have their water and there's berries there too. So it's like, you know, mm-hmm. just puts you on edge a little bit more than you'd like to be. Right. No, oh, I can imagine. Have you ever been on a bear hunt? No, I want to go on a bear hunt. We've like talked about it because Colorado has over the counter bear too. So mm-hmm. we were considering it last year, but we had the two tags that we already had, we were like, well, adding on another third one would just be too much. So I'd like to yeah. do a bear hunt probably in Colorado, but um, definitely not for grizzly. I think grizzly would be a little yeah. bit too scary for me, <laughs> <laughs> but, but for, you know, they, we have bears here in New York too. So it's like, they're not as mm-hmm. common as out there, you know, Last year, we didn't see any bears, but the year before, we saw bears all over the place in Colorado. So it's mm-hmm. like here we have bears. So if we were here and I saw a bear in New York like during the season, I would try and shoot it. But, you know, they're not as common as they are out there. So I definitely want to do mm-hmm. a bear hunt, but not grizzly. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm going on my first bear hunt in September this year, and uh, it's going to be a black bear hunt, um, but I'm extremely excited because I've only ever seen one bear. Well, I've seen grizzlies off in the distance up in Alaska, but I've only mm-hmm. ever seen close quarters, one uh, black bear here in Arkansas, and it was a smaller bear. It was probably maybe 150, 200 pounds, and um, it was walking across the road, and it was kind of dark outside. I was driving to another system for work, and I was like, it's a funny looking dog. I was like, oh crap, that's a black bear. <laughs> and it just finished crossing the road. And that was really my experience with it. But uh, I'm real excited to go. That sounds exciting. Here. So what are you doing? Is it an archery hunt or a gun hunt? It's going to be a gun hunt. That's exciting. I'm going with somebody else. Um, he offered to let me film it. And then he said, after nice. he gets his bear, if we're still there and there's time, that he'll let me get my bear. Because I'll have a bear tag. Nice. So um, we'll see if I get one or not. But just to be there for the experience, yeah. I'm, I'm excited for yeah, that'll Dude, be fun. So cool. Hopefully you have good luck. Yeah, well, thank you. I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> so I see that you have quite the following on Instagram, right? 
So have any doors opened up hunting wise for your social media presence or from it? Um, not really. I've had like a few smaller opportunities. Um, I had, I don't know if you've heard of site mark there. I, th- I believe that they're a Texas based company. Um, but I helped familiar. them. They do like a lot of the night vision scopes. So we do a lot of like coyote hunting. So mm-hmm. I have night vision. So, uh, when they were launching their thermal, I helped them create some content with their thermal scope. So I got that before I ever launched. So I've had like a few smaller opportunities, but nothing like majorly. So, you know, that's kind of like, hopefully along the way, some doors will open, but you yeah. know, for right now, I'm kind of just, I'm not really focused on the social media, like the influencer part of it. I'm kind of just, I do what I love and, you know, I want people to follow that journey and hopefully right. and inspire somebody else too. But I just do what I love and, you know, I like to share my experiences with people. That's awesome. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that your page does look a lot more organic than some of those other influencers out there. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, thank you. I guess on the flip side of that, um, have you ever received any messages or anything like from people saying, oh, man, like you have inspired me to try and do this, like, you know, try and get outdoors or try and pick up hunting or anything like that? Have you gotten any types of any kind of messages? Not really. I've had like a few people be like, oh, I really love your content and like, you know, kind of ask the questions mm-hmm. about hunting. But I haven't really had anybody that's like, you know, that I inspire, I would say I've definitely had people that are like, you know, like some of my uncles to say, like, obviously they're not really on social media, but my one uncle, he always tells me how like he looks up to me and stuff like that. You know, I inspire him. He's a big, you know, he doesn't, he's not a big hunter, but he likes to turkey hunt and the deer hunt. So he's like always asking me questions and stuff like that. And he's always telling me that he looks up to me and stuff. So I wouldn't really say that I get a whole lot of people saying that they look up to me and that I inspire them, but when I do, you know, it really does mean a lot to me. It's like, I'm just out here doing what I love and I hope to inspire people and make people like, you know, have a passion for it. But, you know, I'm just out here showing people what I do, you know, not looking for a whole lot of like people not looking for compliments, you know, but it's like when they come, it is nice, you know, so. For sure. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. But it's like, I would say like you were saying, like some of the women influencers that post, you know, I feel like a lot of not a lot of it, but I feel like I do see some influencers that are hunting that are, you know, they kind of just are pushing it more. It doesn't look as natural. And for me, Mm -hmm. it's like, I don't, I don't love to see that because it's like, I doesn't feel, you know, natural per se. It's more like I see some people that I follow and it's like, they're more fishing for like that influencer kind of lifestyle. And it's like, if you really love to do it, just post it on there and be enjoying it, you know? For sure. I, I, I definitely have seen quite a few of those where, um, and a lot of them are guided hunts too. And so that's one thing that's different with your channels. I noticed that, you know, you, y'all are always unguided. You go and do your own DIY hunts and it seems like more of the quote unquote influencers are the ones that are going to go and spend this money to hire a guy just to get the picture with, you know, their harvest and, and get it for the likes, you know, and, uh, yours is different than that. And that's part of the reason why I reached out to you because I feel like it'd be more of an organic conversation talking about conservation and talking about the experiences rather than just like, Oh yeah, I have, you know, a million followers or whatever. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, I I appreciate it. But yeah, it's like, I do see some of the girls that it's like, they go on these hunts and I'm like, Oh cool. Where do they go? And it's like, Oh, so-and-so outfitter. And I'm like, for me, it's like crazy. Cause I'm like, why would you spend all that money to go on? Like, it's like for, the way I look at it, I'm like, are you really even learning anything? You know, I like to go out and me and Jake and, you know, he teaches me a lot and shows me a lot of things. And it's like, that way I can learn and do it on my own. But I'm like, if you're paying an right. outfitter, like, what are you really learning from there? And you're taking you to your spot and you're shooting the animal. And that's pretty much it. You know? So it's like, yeah. what are you really getting out of that other than a kill and a nice picture? Right. Exactly. So kind of, I guess, diving in more into that, you touched on it a little bit earlier about getting started into hunting. It's best to have a mentor. So do you have any other tips for any other beginner hunters? I would say like it's a lot easier now because there's so many YouTube channels and stuff like that. So it is a lot easier to go online and Jake watches a ton of YouTube videos too. So it's like when he's looking Mm -hmm. for hunting in a new state, like he'll go online and watch a lot of YouTube videos. So I would say there is a lot of information now online that you can find that it's easier. Like obviously when I started hunting when I was younger, like online YouTube wasn't as big of a thing. So there wasn't as many videos about it. So I feel like now there is a lot more online that you can look and watch and like find, you know, starter tips on how to start hunting as well as just like making connections online. Like social media is such a big thing now where it's like you can follow somebody and just send them a DM and ask them questions. So I think definitely now it is a lot easier to 
find a mentor and make connection versus like, you know, when I started hunting, it's like, I didn't have a phone and stuff like that. So it's like, how am I going to really make a connection with anybody, you know, besides like my family and friends and stuff like that. Right. And hunting is definitely one of those where it's hard to do by yourself. Just like fishing, you can go buy a fish pole and go out and catch a fish. You know, it's, it's not as difficult, but when it comes to hunting, it's, it's a lot harder to just go do it. And that's something that I'm not that big of a hunter. I'm not that experienced. I enjoy it, but I'm not that experienced, but it's hard because I don't really have a community here to where I can really interact with others and learn and stuff like that. And so I've gone out a few times into public land and just, you know, looking on the on X map and saying, okay, well, this is most likely an area where they might be, or they're going to go here for food. They're going to go here for water. They're probably going to bed here. And then I can go out and experience it that way. But if you have a mentor, it's definitely a lot easier and you can bounce questions off people and they can show you things or, you know, in, in the bear hunt that I'm going to go to, I'm mainly going for the experience. I'm not going to harvest one myself. It, yeah. If I get to, that would be amazing. But I'm mainly going for the experience just to learn because I've never been on a bear hunt before. Um, so I'm finally, I've been here long enough where I'm starting to make these connections with people to where I'm actually getting these opportunities. But that's definitely one thing is it's, it's kind of a communal thing hunting is it's, it's hard to just go and do it by yourself and, and be successful that way. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely, like I do a lot of whitetail hunting by myself and last year I didn't get any whitetail. I, I shot one and, and it ended up getting away on me, which was, you know, it's not how you want it to go, but mm -hmm. it's unfortunate. And, you know, we always try and practice our best so that way we don't have any mistakes like that, but it does happen as part of it. And it happens to everybody. It's just a learning experience, but uh, like turkey season, we do a lot of like, I do a lot of hunting on my own and I don't mind it. It's definitely more enjoyable going with Jake, but it's like peeps and people like don't think that I go on my own. And then they hear that I go on my own and they're like, are you crazy? And I'm like, no, it's just like, <laughs> I'm out, I'm not, I'm just out doing what I love, you know? And to me, it doesn't matter if I'm alone or with Jake, but it's like definitely more enjoyable when we're together. And, you know, it's also memories that we can share together and different adventures that we can go on together. So, you know, right. it's nice to look back on, obviously if I'm hunting by myself, you know, it's not a memory that we can share together or talk about versus like when we're together, we can be like, Oh, remember this time. And, you know, it's something that we can like reminisce on together. So definitely mm -hmm, it's nice right. having somebody to do it with. That's right. true. That's awesome. Absolutely true. So where can people find you if they want to look at your content or, or follow along with your journey? What are the best places to, to find you at? Mostly just Instagram. That's where I post most of my stuff. You know, eventually I do want to get a YouTube channel just because, mm -hmm. you know, some things that I've noticed as a female, it's like when I'm looking for certain gear, it is harder to find things on YouTube for like, oh, the best women's gear for like, for example, last year I was looking to get a new pack for our hunting trips. And I was like trying to like find the best women's packs and I found like nothing online. So I definitely want to get into making more YouTube content to be able to, you know, show the best things for women and kind of show like my adventures as well. But I feel like a lot of it is like gear because it's like I have so much gear that I know what I like the best. And I feel yeah. like a lot of people like don't know what gear to buy for what seasons and, you know, what's best. So I kind of want to help the women in the community kind of figure out what are the best options for them, like different options that they can choose from. Cause I use a lot of, Sitka and I use Kuyu, but I also have stuff that's like she from Cabela's. So I'm mm -hmm. not, you know, subject to just one brand. Obviously I have my favorite, you know, pairs of clothing and stuff like that, but I think it's definitely helpful to kind of steer people in that right direction of like, okay, this is the best for Turkey. This is the best for whitetail, you know, what's going to keep me warm or what's, you know, cooler, lighter gear, things like that. Yeah. But yeah, definitely like that's Instagram, awesome. I'm the most active on and Jake has a YouTube channel. I think it's just his name, Jake Dollard. But um, okay. he's got some videos up on there, both of us, like turkey hunting and stuff like that. So he's got his own content, but there's some content of me on there as well. So we're, awesome. you know, either working on doing a conjoined YouTube or just my own YouTube. So either way, hopefully YouTube will become, we want to start doing more like filming of our hunts, but it's hard when you're out there trying to film and hunt at the same time. We try to do it yeah. during turkey season and we just got to the point where it was like, you know, we were trying to put the filming first to kind of try and get that content first and then the kill. And then it was like too many birds were getting away where we were just like, screw the camera. We just want to hunt, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's what we're here right. to do. And like, we'd love to film it and show people our adventures, but it's like, especially with Turkey, cause like you're moving so much, it's hard to have that camera. Cause it's like, you got to get it set up. You got to cover it with the, like the camo skin and stuff like that. So it's definitely yeah. a challenge, but we want to start filming and hopefully film our elk hunt this year. So hopefully that'll happen. That would be awesome. Nice. Well, what's your Instagram handle so I can make sure I put it in this podcast episode? Uh, it's Michaela underscore Radecki. Okay. And I'll go ahead and put that in there. And then if you want, you can uh, message me Jake's YouTube channel and I'll put that in the description as well. That yeah. way people can check it out.
Yeah, that'd be great. So, but, and then on top of that, it, I mean, we talked about your business a little bit, but not much about it. So it's a bakery, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Blue, Bu- Blue Buffalo Bakery is my micro bakery that I have. Uh, it's going on two years now. So I do a lot of like farmer's markets. That's my big thing is the farmer's markets during the summertime. So I have one girl that helps me out, work them on the weekends, but like I do a lot of the sourdough breads and stuff like that. People really love mm-hmm. that. So I do like sourdough scones, uh, you know, kind of just like small farmer's items, grab and go breakfast things. But then I do a lot of like weddings too. And like the weddings I like, because I think weddings are such a special day for people that like having good desserts and good food kind of, you know, helps make everything more joyous for that day. You know, it's a, it's a special day. Yeah. So I love being a part of people's weddings and stuff like that. So I've always, always been a baker and I've always just loved it. So it's always been my dream to have my own bakery. So being my own boss and having my own place is really just, you know, it's very rewarding. You know, it's a, it's a lot of hard work, but it's very fulfilling too. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I'll mm-hmm. make sure that I put the information awesome. for your bakery in the description as well. And Thank uh, you. yeah, I, I feel like this is a great time to close it out. Is there anything else that you want to talk about or say prior to us closing the episode out? No, I just, one thing I wanted to talk to you guys about is I noticed you do, that you do a lot of like fly fishing and stuff like that. <laughs> so um, like how did you guys, how did you get into the fly fishing? Cause like, I have always, I'm not a big fisher myself. Like we do like trout every once in a while on the finger lakes out here, but I've always mm-hmm. wanted to get more into fly fishing. Like I think that'd be cool to do out West. Oh, fly fishing is, is amazing. Um, uh, I will tell you though, that be prepared because once you get hooked, you get hooked. <laughs> um, I, I started off as, you know, using conventional gear when I was younger. And uh, Jose is actually the one that got me into fly fishing back in like 2015. And um, me and him had gone out fishing over by my house in Texas when I still lived there. And I wasn't catching anything. And he was out there fly fishing and he was catching fish. And he's like, you want to try this? I said, I don't know what to do with that thing. And he's like, just flip it out there. You'll catch something. And I flipped it out there and I caught something. And it was this little 10, 12 inch bass and it fought and you could feel everything a lot more on a fly rod. And from that point on, I was hooked. And I would go every once in a while back then, but it wasn't until I moved to Arkansas Mm -hmm. that there's actually trout up here. And I was like, oh, I got to get more into fly fishing. And um, I actually started watching Mad River Outfitters on YouTube. And that's where I learned the majority of my stuff from. Um, And I started fishing for trout when I first got here and wasn't really that successful. So then I went back to warm water species. And I think that's where my bread and butter is. I love fishing for carp and, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, pickerel and bass and and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, trout is fun though. And, uh, especially when I go up to the Ozarks and stuff like that, trout's a lot more fun up there for me. Um, and then when I was in Alaska, I was catching some lake trout and catching some rainbow trout in some of the lakes up there. And so that's fun. Um, but yeah, going out West is kind of one of my dreams. I want to go out there, go do some, you know, blue line fishing out there. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would say getting out there and doing it, is probably the best way to do it. And then of course, you know, like you were saying, YouTube for hunting, you could do the same thing for fishing. Um, Mad River Outfitters has a great beginning fly fishing course. Um, and th- I think it's a whole playlist they have together and it talks about, you know, rod weights and line weights and leaders and how to cast. And, um, yeah. but a lot of it's through feel. So even if you're just out in the front yard, flailing it around, you know, <laughs> it's called loading the rod and, and you, it's something you have to feel. You can't learn from, from a YouTube video, but he can, he explains it really well. His name is Brian Fleshig. Okay. Um, and he, he explains everything really well. And he's actually where I learned a lot of my stuff from, um, other than going out and doing it obviously. So. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. I've always, when, whenever we're out there, I always like <clears throat> see the streams and I'm like, man, I'm like, it'd be nice to fish out here. And obviously, you know, like we're not really big into fishing at all. We're, we're more into the hunting. So we're always yeah. like, Oh, you know, maybe we should go fishing. I think, I think last year we were planning on fishing and then our plans changed and we didn't get a chance to, but the streams mm-hmm. out there, it's like, you know, we'll be walking by. And I'm like, Oh, there's definitely fish in here. <laughs> Yeah. And they're pretty compact. So you could probably take a, a, a four piece fly rod with you and, and a little tiny box of flies and probably do a little double, double dip on it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, they, they even make like travel rods. They're like six or seven pieces. And so they're like super, it pecks down super small. So it'd be yeah. nothing to put that on the pack and, you know, keep that with you when you're hiking around. But yeah, it's pretty, it's, if you like archery, you're going to like fly fishing. It's kind of, Fly fishing is like the archery or the yeah. fishing world, if, if you will. And um, ki- kind of like Russell, I got into it. Uh, well, I, I started conventional fishing. And then back in the day, 
Well, I think ESPN and, and South Fox Southwest, they used to have like hunting and fishing shows like early in the morning. And so my, I would go to my grandma's house and I, and my grandfather and I, we'd like, instead of me watching cartoons Saturday morning, I'd be watching uh, hunting and fishing shows with him. And I remember seeing this guy fly fishing. I just thought it was the coolest thing. I was like, man, I want to try that one day. And um, for Father's Day, we ended up getting my, and my grandfather said he wanted to also. So we got him a little like cheapy, like $20 rod and reel combo from Walmart. And there's a, a little creek or a little river close by to where we grew up. And we went out, we'd go out. That's where I learned to fly fish. And, uh, well, thought I learned how to fly fish. I was probably like six years old whipping that thing around. I had no idea what I was doing, you know, but yeah. you don't know what you don't know. And so I thought, man, I was like, man, okay, cool. I got this down, you know, whatever. And I never touched another fly rod since. And then one day, I was like in, I think I was in high school. My grandfather and I went to Cabela's. We passed by the fly fishing section and they had a rod and reel combo for sale. And so we got it and I kind of picked it up again. And so one summer I dedicated that summer to just fly fishing. And so uh, I ended up giving Russell that rod too. It was like a old Cabela's Cahill five or six weight, whatever, Cahill. I forget. I don't know how you pronounce it, but I learned on that. And, I, and then I kind of put it away. Went off to college, got really big into saltwater fishing, but conventional. And I, when I started grad school, I decided that I wanted to try, wanted to try fly fishing again, and uh, just to kind of, you know, add another skill to the mm -hmm. toolbox, if you will. You know, I, I didn't want like my limitations to be, or my not limitations, but rather my experiences to be limited by what I could and couldn't do, you know. So um, I wanted to pick it up as just another means of like getting outdoors. And, you know, I still I ended up really, really liking it. And I ended up moving to College Station for work. And I just kind of stuck with it. I'd still dabbled in conventional. And uh, I was still doing conventional probably 60% of the time, flat fishing 40% of the time. And then around COVID is when it really switched up. Like I really got into fly fishing, really got into fly tying. And it's pretty much all I do now. I only have a few conventional rods I haven't touched in years. And it's not because I'm against it. Kind of like uh, how you were saying, like you still like to, mm -hmm. you know, muzzle loader hunt, rifle hunt, all that stuff. But you, you, you've taken more to uh, fly fishing. That's kind of like how I am. Like I, I just, I just like fishing. Um, but fly fishing is my favorite type of fishing. And so I will always choose it over anything else given mm -hmm. the, given the choice. But I'm also, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not, if someone invites me to go like red fishing, you know, and they only have conventional gear and I can't bring my fly gear for whatever reason, I'm not gonna not go because you know, I'm not going to, I can't take my flower. Right. Of course I'm going to go. So, um, it's just given the choice. I'm always going to pick up the flower out if I can. And, uh, it's just, you know, I just love it. It's, it's, and it's kind of one of the reasons why I picked up archery as well. I picked up archery for the same thing. You know, I, I wanted to just kind of add something else, you know, extend my season a little more, if you will, not that I hunt much to begin with, but mm -hmm. just another thing. And, um, and I actually really like archery hunting now, probably more than gun hunting. You know, not to say I won't pick up a gun; it's just given the choice. Again, I'd rather pick right. up. I'd rather pick up the bow. But um, as far as like getting into it, uh, I was all self-taught. So YouTube was like my best friend, and um, like what Russell mentioned, Mad River is a huge resource. They have some of the best, probably, series for beginners and things like that. Um, if you have another thing, I'll mention is if you have any fly shops near you. A lot of times they'll have uh, like lessons and classes. You can go over there and a good fly shop should um, give you some pointers. Like uh, like if you want to try out a rod, they should like, they'll be able to line one up for you, kind of, you know, take you out and show you how to cast it a little bit, kind of get you going. A good fly shop should do that. And then a lot of times, at least like the ones around here, they'll have weekends where it's like a, they'll have like offer beginner classes and stuff like that. So if you don't really know, they'll kind of teach you the ins and outs of fly fishing and all that stuff, like what to look for in rods, how to tie knots, how to get everything set up, how to cast and all that. Um, you could even pay. They should offer lessons like to to uh, get your to work on your cast essentially, casting lessons. And that's kind of the biggest challenge is uh, I would mm -hmm. think is the fly casting. Like everyone. 
everyone that I've met who has thought that they could just go kind of get into it like nothing, they've always struggled with the cast because mm-hmm. it is different. You know, it's a, it's a very different technique than conventional fishing. It's very easy to overpower the rod and, and your cast just, or to get the timing off and it just doesn't work out. And that's probably the most frustrating thing. And it's probably what deters people a lot is, you know, that whole casting thing. But once you get that figured out, cause you only really, realistically, you only need to cast like 20, 30 feet to catch fish. If that, you know, depending on where you're at. So once you're there, like you're, you're golden. And you could probably do that by the end of the lesson. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. Or just going in your front yard and just practicing. That's all I did too. And, um, so I don't have, I don't have the prettiest cast, but I have what I'd like to call a fisherman's <laughs> cast. Cause as long as I'm catching fish, I don't really care what it looks like, you know? So, um, but that's probably the biggest thing. So yeah, I, I guess in, in addition to the YouTube, I would say find, um, find a local fly shop that can really help you out. And I'm not talking like right. Bass Pro or Cabela's or anything like that, like a legitimate fly shop. Not to say that Yeah, but like the more, uh, yeah, like a kind of small special, mom and I pop think. kind of like fly shop would probably yeah. be more the place to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And then, uh, and honestly, uh, Facebook of all things, like, or even Instagram, they have a lot of uh, like Facebook groups and things like that. It's really cool to kind of like meet up with, with people, like-minded individuals. And they, you know, a lot of them, especially like what I've noticed in the fly fishing community, they're very, uh, they're, they're very like helpful. They're, they love to just kind of help you out, take people fishing who maybe who don't know how, or, you know, give people some lessons or whatever the case may be. Like that's one thing I will say about the fly fishing community. They're very helpful, very, um, I guess community oriented, if you will. Like they, I like everyone I've met through, uh, I've met quite a few of my friends through Facebook and stuff like that, just on, so on like fishing groups and things like that. So it's kind of cool how that worked out. So I'd probably just say, um, say that like, uh, just, you know, find some local groups and, and actually there's like, there are some like woman, uh, centered groups. Like I think Orvis has that 50, 50 on the water one. And then, um, there might be one in New York, but like here in, 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 in central Texas, they have, uh, what is it? Texas women fly yeah, fishers or something I like that. So. Or, um, the, the green fly girl society. And it's pretty cool. Cause it's like a bunch of girls getting together and going on these trips and just like mm-hmm. going fishing and hanging out. They'll go to the coast. Sometimes they'll do some like, um, like, uh, like actual like trap, like trips where you have to travel and they do all this, like these excursions. It's pretty freaking awesome. Yeah. Like, definitely it's, something it's to look dope. into. Yeah. So that's what I, I would say. Like if, I mean, as, as bad as social media can be to some degree, I think it's also like a good way to connect with, uh, with the like-minded folks and stuff like that, especially when it comes to the fly fishing community. So that might be something to get into it too. Um, and then if you're ever in Arkansas or Texas, uh, you and your boyfriend, like we could, we'd love to, you know, show you guys around and take you guys. Fishing yeah. For urban area. That'd be, that'd so, be fun. Yeah. I know free. he's got some family down in Texas and when I was younger, yeah. I went down to Texas too. I had some family down there, but yeah, if we ever make our way out there, we'll be sure to let you guys know and we can do some fishing together. For sure. We'd, we'd love to take you all out. Heck yeah, I think I think between Russ and I, we got – yeah, I think between you <laughs> and I got gear, like you guys are safe. Sounds good, yeah. Yeah, we got lots of hunting gear, but fishing stuff, it's like few and far in between. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of the opposite. I have two deer rifles, uh, 122, a bow, and then like – 800 things fishing so <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no, that's how we are for hunting it's like we have totes upon totes for you know different hunting clothes and stuff like that but it's like fishing we have like a few poles and an old tackle box and that's kind of it <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome well we appreciate you hopping on it's been a great episode and uh, i'll make sure i'll put all y'all's links in the description so um this episode should be coming out if i'm not mistaken uh, next Tuesday. Um, okay. and then I'll go ahead and I, I make little mm-hmm. clips and stuff and post them on Instagram. Like I'm sure you've seen, I'll tag yeah. you on all those, but, um, yeah, we appreciate you hopping on. It's been a great conversation and yeah, uh, it's been a great time. Thanks for having me on. Mm-hmm. I appreciate it. It was nice to chat with you guys and, you know, get to talk with you. It, it definitely was. So for, for the listeners, uh, thank y'all for listening to the end and we will catch y'all next time. This has been wildlife outdoors. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook at Wildlife Outdoors and on Instagram at wild.life.outdoors. Let's go live life on the wild side.